I think we will never get back to the old normal. I think what will happen is a new normal will emerge. I think that a hundred years from now, there will be fundamentalist Christians who are virtually unchanged from what they are now in terms of what they believe. Uh, they'll, They'll either be more violent and more vicious and more in control and more powerful or more resentful and more angry and more fearful, or they will have maybe retreated into enclaves of fundamentalism. But I think fundamentalism in all religions has a very, very long staying power. Brian, you you obviously started writing about some of these things uh, back in the '90s, uh, if I remember. You you were already starting to be noted as a evangelical open thinker, and then you even were shifting or changing uh, even before all that caught up to you. We see it now, but you started writing about these things. In the 90s, Marcus Borg started writing about these things in the 80s and others uh, as well. And how 20th century Christianity ended certainly gave way to a lot of this evolution in the 21st century. But I wanted to ask you a question that I know is probably impossible to answer. But in thinking about 100 years from now... Where where do you think this whole evolution, at least of Western Christianity, where do you think it's headed over the next century? David, you're reminding me of a, a friend of mine who's a professional futurist, and he tells the story about someone from Boeing who came to him and said, could you help me predict the future of Boeing you know, aircraft? And uh, he said, no, but I could help you predict the future of aviation. In wow. other words, um, I think what he was saying is... Y- you, you you can and and actually a futurist wouldn't use the word predict they would talk about forecast but sure. um what one of the things they say is you have to start with the right frame um you know the, a large enough frame because um well for all kinds of reasons we could talk about if we had days rather than minutes to talk uh so h- here's what i'd say for people thinking about that question the first thing i'd say is <clears throat> The entire human project, I think, is at an inflection point. And for us to talk about what will happen to evangelicalism or whatever is emerging from evangelicalism or Christianity or religion, um, we can't even talk about those things sensibly unless we talk about, I think, the bigger foment and tumult that we're in. I, I think we're at the end of a very long story of a way that human beings relate to the earth and to each other. Mm. And um, and I think all of our religions emerged and developed to help facilitate that process of making that way of relating to the earth and each other work. Um, and I think we're at the end of that now. And, mm. and the reason I think it's worth getting sort of big picture like that is because I was a pastor for 24 years and I and since leaving whatever it was 16 years ago, uh, the pastorate, I, oh gosh, 17 or 18 years ago now, um, I uh, I work mostly with clergy. So, um, and I care about churches and I care about religion and spirituality because I care about human beings. And this is essential to what we human beings are about. Um, but when you're in spiritual leadership in these times, you it's very easy to feel like the mess we're in is our fault <laughs> and uh, and if not our fault we feel it's our responsibility to fix relatively soon and what i think is a better way to frame this is that we're at the end of a whole long chapter uh, of human history of christian history of protestant history of evangelical history whatever we want to say it's all wrapped up together we're at the end of a chapter the new chapter hasn't begun yet. We're in the painful, difficult, long process of an old way disintegrating and the new way taking shape. Um, and with that in mind, what I'd say a hundred years from now, it, uh, I'll say maybe two things about that, and then we can go wherever you want to go, David. But first thing I'd say is 
a hundred years from now, we will either have really addressed our environmental crisis or our environmental crisis will have addressed us <laughs> in a very decisive way. Um, and, and closely related to that, a hundred years from now, we will either be in a better form of democracy and a better form of economy or something very, very different. And all of that will affect whatever our shape our religious life takes. And so what when I started writing in 1998, I thought if we could just solve a couple of these things, we could have this thing fixed in 10 or 20 years, you know. Um, what I think now is our job is to accompany people spiritually through a very, very long and very dangerous multi-generational transition period. And that that doesn't make the job easier, but I think it helps us be more realistic about what we're dealing with. Now, that may be so vague as to be useless, but let me just stop and see where you, you'd want to go from there. No, no, no. Do you... And and I I I agree with the the political tumult, the environmental tumult. You know the the uh, capitalism seems like it's run amok. Um, yeah. uh, certainly, when you say a long time, do you is it a couple? Gen I mean, uh, how do we know? Is it more yeah. like what the late Phyllis Tickle talks about? Are we in a five hundred year kind of uh, shift? This is going to take a while. Yeah, I think we're in a shift that's going to take generations to, and I, and I think we will never get back to the old normal. I yeah. think what will happen is a new normal will emerge, and so many of our institutions and theologies and everything else will be transformed through this. I think that a hundred years from now, there will be fundamentalist Christians who are virtually unchanged from what they are now in terms of what they believe, they'll be very different in their attitude. They'll either be like mullahs uh, with AK-47s or whatever the 100 year from now version of, you know, uh, 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 high powered uh, weapons will be. Um, uh, they'll, they'll either be more violent and more vicious and more in control and more powerful or more resentful and more angry and more fearful, or they will have maybe retreated into enclaves of fundamentalism. But I think fundamentalism in all religions has a very, very long staying power. Yeah. Um, and so I think if if all people are interested in job security, there's great job security in being a fundamentalist, right? Um, uh uh, if, if people are interested in saying what will be a redemptive and loving and I would say Christ-like expression of faith 100 years from now, I think there will be, I think there will be those expressions of faith. Um, maybe I could just, and, and the question of what churches will look like, I don't know, but I, maybe I could offer three things that I, th there are so many, but let me offer three things that I think are really in play in the coming decades, okay? Um, the, the first one is, I think we're moving, oh, we're, we're seeking an alternative to religious exclusivism on the one hand and a kind of relativistic religious pluralism on the other. And there's some kind of synthesis or third option there that will involve each religious tradition discovering its greatest treasures understanding its greatest treasures, because our religions tend to not even know what our greatest treasures are. Um, yeah. But but they're there. And, and for us to rediscover our greatest treasures, simultaneously do that, offer to share them with everybody, whatever their religion, and be willing to receive the treasures that we want to receive that are offered as gifts from other traditions. I think that is an alternative that's different from religious exclusivism and different from relativistic pluralism. I think it is a, a collaborative or collegial way that our religious traditions uh, yeah. can work together. Yeah. Um, that's one, that's a possible option. Second thing I think that we're going to be dealing with is I think our, our notions of a patriarchal dominating, controlling God are going to become increasingly untenable. And for that, and to the degree that people hold on to a dominating patriarchal controlling God, 
they people will either become atheists or fundamentalists. I think that idea of God will tend to drive people away. And then I think new understandings of God are emerging that are much more uh, inherent to creation and to the universe, that it's not a creator separated from creation. It's a creator in and with uh uh, creation, which in some ways is where we end up in Christianity, first with the idea of Jesus as incarnation, and second with the idea of the Holy Spirit moving in creation. So um, that would be a second thing. And then the third thing I think is, I'll just mention, is that I think faith communities will increasingly understand themselves not on by, by based on a set of beliefs, but based on a set of promises that they are committed to keeping um, yes. promises that they can make and that they can keep. For example, to be able to say to young parents, um, if, if you have children and bring them into our community, here is what we hope. Here's what we're committed to helping your children learn and become as human beings. Here's the kind of uh, children we childhood we hope that we'll do everything we can to help them have. Here's the kind of adolescence we'll do everything we can. Here's the kind of adulthood. And for you as an adult, here's the kind of middle age and old age that we would like you to have. See, it's a very, very different role. It's the role of spiritual formation. And instead of making demands that people believe, and then we dispense benefits of what will happen after you die, we will be saying, here is what we are committed to, in the sense what we believe matters and is important. And as a result of that, here are the promises we can make for what we will, the spiritual formation that we will try to uh, to assist with in your life. Does that does that make sense? Uh, yeah. uh, it totally does. And so good. And Brian, I would imagine if that's what you think or wonder or ponder, there's probably some days you're encouraged by things that you see that are taking us that way. And then I'm sure there are some days you are discouraged by what you see that maybe it's not taking us that way. So on the days that you are encouraged, what are some of the things you might be seeing now mm -hmm. that encourage you? And then on the days that you go, oh, damn, I'm not sure. I'm not sure any of this is happening at all. And the days you're discouraged, what do you see then? Mm -hmm. well, let me start with the, the second um, and yeah. just get that out of the way. Uh, I am never discouraged uh, in the sense of, I, I see so many good things happening. And now part of this is that I've really lowered my expectations. <laughs> and I've also become, I think, more, uh, my, my understanding of the change that we're involved with has gotten much deeper. So I've lowered my short-term expectations, right? Yeah. Um, what does Richard Rohr say? Expectations are resentments or disappointments waiting to happen. So uh, I've lowered my expectations short-term for sure. Um, uh, and I expect things to get a lot worse before they get a lot better. And in fact, I think what will make things get better is all the things getting worse. I agree. Uh, and so um, I, I don't get discouraged about that. The th only thing I get discouraged about is that our coping with our environmental crisis is a timed test. And there are consequences that happen from not getting to certain benchmarks in time. And if we don't get to those things in time, you know, it's going to sort of change what's possible in, in the next hundred years and, and f far beyond that. So putting that aside, what encourages me? Oh gosh, so many things, um, but I'll, I'll just tell you the ones that come to mind. First thing that encourages me, for the first time in Christian history, um, feminist theology, black theology, uh, Lat uh, Latin A theology, uh, 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 Asian theology, indigenous theology, queer theology, uh, I, all these different kinds of theologies yeah. that that are people who have incredibly important perspectives to offer, both looking at the past, looking at the present, looking at the future. Uh, they're actually in the game, and 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 the white patriarchal theology that has dominated Christianity will only make will only maintain its hegemony in places of fundamentalism. 
evangelical fundamentalism, mainline Protestant fundamentalism, Roman Catholic fundamentalism, Eastern Orthodox fundamentalism, and there are fundamentalisms of all those sorts. Um, uh, and so to me, that is incredibly encouraging. I didn't think that we would see this much progress this fast. So uh, that to me is really positive. Second, on that issue I brought up about our understanding of what we mean when we say the word God. Um, we have so much progress being made there. And it's not being made only within Christianity. Um, it's it's being made across religious and non-religious lines. Let me just give you an example. The number of uh, evangelical women who sneak off to go to yoga uh, a couple times a week, I think people would be shocked at. Well, the very experience of yoga is in a sense taking people out of the parts of their left prefrontal cortex that evangelicalism wields all of its power over. <laughs> right, totally. And, and yeah. so all those things are are happening uh, in, in very, very exciting ways. Um, and then the fact that, uh, that and, and I would also just say, as someone who started writing about this, and it, when my first book came out in 1998, I thought I would lose all my friends. I thought I would be excommunicated for communicated from everything, and that um, you know it, I didn't expect that you know these years later there'd be all these podcasts around the world that to me function a little bit like the ninety five theses on the wall and the printing press for Martin Luther. It just feels to me like the uptake on this important conversation is happening staggeringly fast. Can I mention one other thing? Please, um, please. That I think for evangelical, for people brought up in an evangelical or charismatic or whatever uh, conservative Protestant setting, um, over the last couple of years, I, I wrote a book a few years ago called Life After Doom. I, I'm sorry, called uh, Faith After Doubt. My next book's called Life After Doom. It was called Faith After Doubt. And the book got picked up by Mormons. And a lot of more Mormons behind the scenes started reading it. Totally. And um, what has been so interesting is watching a parallel conversation happening among Mormons. Oh my gosh. And 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 as I've gotten, I've been invited into those spaces. And I just feel like if evangelicals knew how similar they are to Mormons and vice versa, they they would be if, you know, old time evangelicals would be infuriated for me to say that. But <laughs> sure. the sociology is just staggeringly similar. Uh -huh. And the fact that the systems are being shaken uh, means that new things happen. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, Brian, to your point that fundamentalism has been with us, there'll be a form of it staying with us, you know, and it shows up in our religious constructs. Uh, I mean, don't you think, I mean, when you start reading a couple academic papers on the psychology of religion, yeah. the sociology of religion, yeah or of belief, you start seeing that the reason fundamentalism has been with us will continue to stay with us. Yeah. It's a psyche issue, right? We, yeah. we find it then in our supernatural constructs, yeah. but the issue lies in our humanness, right? Our fears, our, our differences, right? Yeah. In fact, yeah, I, I'd say it's psychological and sociological, and you mash those two together and you realize, just I'll give you one quick example that I think is very relevant to us in our country. I live in Florida. I think you're in, in Tennessee and our yep. two states uh, are in many ways on the front lines of this. But um, if you go back in history, the relationship between authoritarian leaders and religious leaders uh, of a certain sort is so deep. And, and when you read Hannah Arendt and her writing about authoritarianism, and the aftermath of World War II, and you see, uh, oh my gosh, it just, it, of course, these are these are features of human uh, of human society. For anyone who's never read Rene Girard, Rene Girard has just uh, shows these deep psychological and sociological realities that then express themselves in in religion in in positive ways and in maybe you know, what I would call negative and destructive ways, but inevitably, unless we, unless we learn better ways of living with ourselves and others and the earth, 
um, you know, we'll keep repeating those, those yeah. cycles. Yeah. You know, and, and Brian camping on that word authority. And one of the things you mentioned before where the whole thing is shifting, whether we're, we're talking about uh, religion, uh, economics, uh, politics, there seems to be this shift right towards our and certainly people younger than you and I a, a shift towards what authority is and what authority oh. means right absolutely I, I just saw this play out in headlines just a couple of weeks ago in the Catholic Church um, you know Pope Francis has been calling for uh, synods or gatherings of the church of listening um, church leaders coming together to listen to the people. And an African bishop uh, made a very bold statement that was just obviously, you know, striking back at Pope Francis. Of course, it's usually American bishops doing this. Um, and he said, the church is not called to listen. The church is called to preach. Now, there is a, a pious wow. and pompous statement. But um, uh well, you just see it, it, it hitting us in the face again and again, how this, the, 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 it's like the, the veil of the temple is torn. Well, the fabric of the church is torn between authoritarianism that wants to do all the speaking and none of the listening. Um, similarly, another example from when Pope Francis, shortly after he became Pope, one of the first things he did was he apologized and uh, to a bunch of people the church had hurt. And then a group of bishops came along behind trying to clean up to say, well, he's not saying we did anything wrong. Um, even more recently, I think- I remember that, yes. One of the super historically significant things that's happened in, in, in you know recent months is that the Catholic church has acknowledged that it was wrong with something called the doctrine of discovery. If people haven't heard of the doctrine of discovery, um, Mark Charles has a remark, uh, uh, evangelical Navajo Indian um, uh, from, from evangelical background, wrote, wrote a book with uh, evangelical professor Sung Chan Ra called Unsettling Truths, and they do a great introduction. But the Catholic Church said, we were morally wrong in what we did with the doctrine of discovery. And now a whole group of Catholic scholars are saying that shows that the Pope is illegitimate because mm -hmm. You can't say we did something morally wrong because that would mean that we're not infallible in our uh, ex cathedra pronouncements, and and so here's this battle, and and it just highlights this question about authority. Some people see authority as willing to listen, others see as refusal to listen. Some see authority as willing to admit you're wrong. Others see authority as never being wrong and never admitting it, right? You could just see this tear in what we mean by authority and it's going to redefine religion. Um, uh, I, I remember one other quick anecdote of this, but I forget how many years ago, but uh, you know, in the last decade or so, uh, about a decade, um, the Dalai Lama uh, said, uh, if a scientific finding was proven that said some teaching of Buddhism was wrong, I would change my Buddhist, I would change my opinion. Um, uh, and I just thought to myself, I felt jealous because I thought, how many Christian leaders will come out and say that? So this is, yeah, that's, that's one of the, to me, the classic issues of, uh, of authority. And there are many others we could talk about power over versus power under and power with all kinds of ways to talk about this shift in authority, but major, major, major. Yeah. And as, as former evangelicals, conservative Protestants, certainly in an American Western way. So Brian does, um, does the future Jesus end up the King of Kings? Does the, is the future Jesus uh, a monarch? And by the way, in in the church I am the minister in now, we 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 don't have any monarch language uh, yes. in our yes. in our church. So, is the Bible still authoritative? You know the you know from our systematic theology classes, the authority you know the authority yeah. of yeah. the scriptures. So, yes, how how is this? 
how is this aspect of authority now, how are we experiencing it shifting in, in a relationship with Christ, in a relationship yeah. with our with our uh, ancient scriptures? So this to me is, yeah, the, for evangelicals to deal with the issue of authority means dealing with the issue of scripture since that, that was sort right. of a raison d'etre. Right. And, um, and, and this to me is a parallel situation to what I mentioned before. You have some people who will double down on the authority or inspiration of scripture, other people who will throw out scripture entirely. And I think there's a third option um, that will emerge. But getting to your question of how this relates to what we say and do and celebrate about Jesus, I first of all, David, I am absolutely thrilled to hear that your congregation has tackled this issue of monarchy. Um, and uh, and so maybe I could say it in in two ways. In the Judea, Jewish and Christian traditions, um, uh, and that plural is there are many Jewish traditions and there are many Christian traditions, right? So it's a, but in them, we could say that images for God have been very focused on king related uh, images. Um, but here's the thing a king is a metaphor. Oh. Uh, and, and the metaphor arose in a historical context. Um, so, if the first kings emerge sometime in the last 12,000 years, nobody ever could have said that God was a king before 12,000 years ago. Such a thing wouldn't didn't exist, right? It didn't exist. But the idea of king became so deeply embedded in human societies for a very, very, very long time that then we took an idea in our society and we projected it onto the universe. So when I was a kid, um, I don't think people hear about this so much anymore. Maybe they do. But we knew that the king of the beasts was the lion and the king of the birds was the eagle. We took this sort of pyramidal social structure and we projected it on the universe. And then when we did the same, when we said that God was the king, we projected it on the entire cosmo cosmic reality. We did the same with the idea of father. I personally think part of what Jesus is doing in the gospels is he's trying to soften the idea of king with the idea of father. Occasionally, he even softens the idea of patriarchy by comparing God to a woman or a mother. But he's working with what the people are, are ready for, right? But what we Christians do then is we take patriarchy combined yeah. with monarchy, and we project that on the universe. And we don't live in that universe anymore. Sure. And it's it's going to change the way we talk about God. So here's the way I like to say it. I like to say it this way. If we truly respect the Bible, does the Bible teach us a ceiling of language and metaphors beyond which we're never able to grow? Or does the Bible teach us that people developed metaphors in their own times and cultures that then teaches us that we need to find the right metaphors and language in our time and culture. Yes. And I think those are two ways to love and respect the Bible. But uh, but yeah, but I don't think they coexist super well. Yeah, no, it's so good, <laughs> Brian, so good. Um, you know, Brian, one of the things I've wondered about um, in, in even being critical towards the movement uh, having having a healthy, hopefully a healthy, mature critique towards the even the progression in movement I'm part of. One of the things I've I've thought about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is sometimes I'll wonder, you know, nothing speaks more of white privilege than spiritual deconstruction. Um, you know, when you think of uh, desperate parts of the world that are holding on by their fingertips to uh, a supernatural view of a God that they are desperately trying to cling to. And then here I am uh, with my pressed white shirt and 
uh, all of my accoutrements of comfort going, gee, I wonder if I believe in penal substitution anymore. I wonder how uh, historic criticism has really affected our view of the Bible. It's not that I'm scoffing that. I think that's those are important conversations. So it's not the crit that critique I'm scoffing. I'm just trying to be sober towards it is still my white privilege that allows me to deconstruct and I need to have a sober humility towards even that is how does that sound is that crazy thinking or no no I, I think that's I think that's very real especially when in the deconstruction pro process people scoff at people in far more desperate situations who cling to ideas of God that have a very different function in their life than they do for white privileged people. So uh, uh, is that clear or? Yeah, I, no, yeah. right. That's right. But, uh, but yeah. I'd add something to it because, because white privilege is real. I think white responsibility is real as well. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, when, you know, you and I are people who have, uh, uh, benefited without anything we have earned, we have benefited by centuries of privilege and oppression and supremacy and so on. And, and if we become morally unsatisfied to go on with that, then it seems to me there's a kind of deconstruction that is also an expression of white responsibility. It's good. Uh, and and so it, it becomes a responsibility to say, I have been a beneficiary of something and I'm on the inside of it and I understand it from the inside and I will not support it and I will not be silent about it and I will not just try to escape from it, but I will speak the truth about it. I will be, uh, the term that we use in business or government is I'll be a whistleblower about it. And I will, and not only that, I will try to take my deconstruction far beyond just liberating myself from parts of the religion that I feel have hurt me. I will try to use whatever position I have and the knowledge and experience I have to liberate other people and to liberate people of the future uh, from this. But here's where it becomes really delicate. And your question, I think, is so morally important and informed. But at the same time that, that I do that, I have to realize that other people, including desperate people who have the very opposite of privilege, um, the very language that I might be attacking, the structures I might be attacking are the best thing they have that keep them alive. I, I think that's part of what Jesus meant when he said, you know, anyone who causes one of these vulnerable children to suffer, you know, and it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a way of saying, look, be careful the way you do these things, because you can have unintended consequences. And anyone who thinks, here's where, when deconstruction becomes a crusade of an, what I call the cult of innocence, um, and even the cult of correctness, like you thought you were correct, I'm more correct. <laughs> you thought you were innocent. I'm more innocent. Yeah. Whenever that happens, we're re recreating what we were trying to get away from. We're still fundamentalists, right? In a bizarre way, we're carrying on a yeah. feature of fundamentalism that we actually despise, but our act of despising it makes us people who despise things. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. So Brian, with this with this responsibility, then, and I I like that. That's well articulated. Um, you know, as whether we're reading a Pew poll or a Gallup poll, looking at um, you know, the first couple decades of of even uh, of twenty first century evangelicalism uh, decline. Remember, you and I were both twenty, uh, you know, good twentieth century Christians when. Part of the banner we waved was the main lines were declining, but yeah. uh, all forms of evangelicalism, uh, born again Christianity, were were growing. And now we know, well, 
uh, not so quick. It's give it time. It's it's shifting and shifting rapidly. In talking about the responsibility, it seems like um, intellectuals, science oriented uh, people, um, just common sense, sane thinking people have left uh, the American Western church in droves. And so though I believe Christianity and the message of Christ needs to be, it, it needs to be for everybody. It has to be for all people. But part of that responsibility, it seems like we're losing that crowd. What, what are your thoughts on that? What happens if Christianity loses the intellectuals, the common sense, sane thinking people, the science oriented people that just go, it's too bizarre, too crazy, too simple, too nuts, too supernatural to yeah. even hold on to this. Thoughts yeah. on that? Oh my, so much, uh, so much. You, you are, I think, asking just the right questions. Well, first, can I say, just jumping back, and then I want to get back to this important question. Um, when I talked about white responsibility, I want everyone to understand I am not re trying to resurrect the old white man's burden idea, which was uh, a, just a, a new another expression of white supremacy and all the rest, which is, you know, so I'm not saying that at all. I'm what I'm saying by that is more like what, you know, black indigenous and uh, other people of color say to white people who come to them saying, what should we do? And they tend to say, go do your homework and, and go deal with problems in your own community. Um, so uh, that's that's what I, I meant by that. So I just wanted to Thank you. Uh, yeah. make yeah. that clear. Um, uh, so yes, uh, here is our, our problem. Um, it's not just that the world is fragmented between intellectuals and sort of moderately educated people and uneducated people. It's that each of those categories is also fragmented in any number of ways. And, uh, and meaning what socioeconomic, uh, racial, is that, is that what you mean? I mean, socioeconomic, I mean, racial, I mean, political. So there are hardcore intellectuals who are hardcore right wing, uh, you know, whatever. I mean, uh, uh, there are, you know, I, in other words, the, the polarizations that are tearing us apart are occurring at all those levels. And any place, anything that we say it, it's just not our fault, but we can't escape it. Anything, let, let's just say in the United States, we took concert, uh, we took uh, Democrat versus Republican. Um, and, and now it's, there aren't, there are hardly any Republicans who aren't MAGA Republicans, at least they're willing to pretend they are in, in their pursuit of power, which in a certain way makes them like, you have to believe it when they say that's what they are. They they care of all they care about is winning in power. That's the essence of what MAGA is about. So if you have the world divided in these two categories, then it doesn't matter if you're intellectual or if you're sort of middle of the road, you know, or if you're anti-intellectual. The first thing people are going to listen to is which of the left or right side are you on? And I think it's going to get even more complicated than that, because this current arrangement of polarized Republicans and polarized Democrats will run its course eventually. And we won't return to uh, uh, will will I, I wouldn't be surprised if 10 or 15 years from now, we long for the day when we just had two clear polarized parties. <laughs> we might end up with four or six and and. Um, uh, each with their own intractable polarization. I say that because, going back to what we said before, that there are psychological dimensions of this, sociological dimensions of this, that play across religion, play across industry, play across education, you know, every different um, yeah. sphere of life. So here's the answer, I think. Uh, 
I think people like you and me, and especially you know, and and especially younger men and women, uh, younger people who become pastors, spiritual leaders of any kind, they're going to have to go to the deepest core of their being, what uh, Howard Thurman calls the sound of the genuine, and they're going to have and and. When they get to that deepest, honest core of their being, it's not that they have all the answers. It's that they have some awareness of what they're confident about and what is a mystery to them uh, and what troubles them. And, and, and from that deepest part of them, they will speak. And I think what will happen when they speak is that they will attract people from all those different sectors who will be attracted by authenticity and honesty, and whatever degree of wisdom and intelligence that they have. Um, it won't be, it won't fit in with the existing categories. It will draw people beyond the existing categories, I think. Um, and, and if it ever gets to the point where that results in rapid growth, like everybody lusted for in the 1990s with the church growth movement and ever since that will tell us we're pretty far along in the process <laughs> because early on in the process it can never gr grow quickly i mean isn't it ironic for you and i who you know came of age in the church growth movement era that like i, I look back and i think to myself if i could get rick warren and bill hybels and John Maxwell, a lot of these people in a room back in the 1990s and said to them, I, I want to tell you, you're going to aggregate thousands of people in your congregation, hundreds of thousands of people who follow you around the world, millions of people who follow you around the world, and all of them will be given to Donald Trump. And all of your efforts will lead to creating a political base for Donald Trump. I mean, if I think if they understood what that meant, they would have quit. Uh, back then, <laughs> or done something very different. Yeah. But uh, it's what has actually happened. So I'm sorry yeah. if that is a uh, no. too much. Uh, but yeah, no, 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 no. Um... Yeah, let, let me just maybe the, to try to make some sense of that, uh, where I was going in 10 different directions. Let me just say, what that means, I think, is that every one of us has this awesome opportunity and terrifying challenge of speaking from our heart, of speaking what we truly believe and what we truly care about and thinking that through and thinking of its obvious effects and its potential unintended consequences. And, and yeah, I, I, and that is both an awesome responsibility, but I mean, that I think is what got us in this business to start with. I think that's what when people feel any true sense of vocation, I think that's, I don't think anybody feels called to, I'd really like to become the manager of a human aquarium where we just keep people in their little glass box and make sure they never have a new thought for the rest of their life. I don't think anybody ever was, no. real, that's not what they really wanted. Right. And you know, Brian, as I listened to your, um, listen to that, it's an interesting confusion between ideology and theology um, where what we would think of sane people or smart people uh, or, you know, to give a colloquial, people that we would say should know better, people that should know better would then pick in a, a more powerful ideology surround their theology uh around it it just yeah i just you know back to your thought on maga power that what can drive us towards an ideology right is either a, a deep human insecurity and fear which we hold on we need that authority or a thirst and lust for power to get that uh ideology and by the way, I was working for Bill Hybels in the 90s and uh, knowing I, I didn't know him well, but knowing where he was at then, even politically meeting with Clinton and and then uh, where he was on Obama, uh, then you're right. If you go look, look what happened. Uh, yes, I, I 
I think I think those group of people would be utterly discouraged. But thoughts on ideology and yeah. Yeah, let me add one thing to your um what did you say? It's lust for power and uh fear. Why would, or... Yeah, why we become ideologues? Why, you know, why why would Harvard trained people follow Jim Jones? Like why would yeah. that happen? So um it, it seems like back to the sociology and psyche of yeah. why we need an authoritative ideology. Yeah. It's right. We either lust and thirst for power or there's a deep damage in our need for it. We're hell bent or shame bent. Maybe yeah. back to the Mark Driscoll. Why would so many people follow that? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a whole other study of the congregation of these are shame. These are people who have been we've all been prepped in this shame bent need to be mm -hmm. shamed. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think I think it really does. I I think I, I might add a, another category along with shame and fear and lust for power, and it's just desire for security. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of people, this is their job, and they aren't comfortable with it, but they go along with it, and there are certain rewards that come along with it, and it it, it they don't even really want power; they just want to be able to not. They want to be able to support their family, or if they're a pastor, they actually care about their staff, and they know if they don't go along with this, people will stop giving, and then they'll have to lay off the worship leader and the children's ministry worker. You know what I mean? Like it, it, there are good intentions mixed in with with the uh, with the mess. So all of that, I think, has to do with. A financial model for the way that religions that that congregations run congregations and denominations but especially congregations and um this is a place where i feel david that uh i i feel we're we, we've got incredible resources for theology and so on but man a, an economic model that would help us get to a different place for congregational life, I don't know what that is. I mean, a lot of people have ideas, but I, I, I have a feeling that uh, I, I have a feeling that's one of those things that's going to emerge. And maybe I could say it like this: to the degree that a capitalist system is running the show, um, you, you you don't have any choice but to work with a capitalist system. And, and what is ideal longer term might be something that's beyond capitalism, not only beyond what capitalism is, but beyond what we have been shaped by capitalism could even imagine, right? That might be our future 100 or 300 years from now. Um, but uh, while we're in the middle here, what it says to me is we have to be very, very savvy about how we deal with money. And, um, and yeah, I mean, that's the most yeah. obvious thing. Yeah. But. Well, I, you know, I'm not sure when um, 17th and 18th century philosophers were talking about what capitalism could be as we are shifting from a monarch. I, I, I certainly don't think they thought it would be the kind of corporate and CEO greed in the yeah. right it's 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 run amok i'm not even this, sure we have capitalism yeah th this is a huge uh tangent that i think is super interesting i'll just tell you a quick anecdote that is in, in many ways probably a tangent but many years ago one of the great delights of my life was i got to travel across latin america with a latin american theologian Rene padilla and uh i now i've forgotten which country we were in but um uh, I was asked to be part of a, a theological colloquium, um, and they and in Latin America it was very safe to talk about capitalism and Marxism. Uh, you know, you, in some ways they were both viable options, and it wasn't like all Christians supported capitalism, and you know only atheists supported Marxism. It was very very different, mm -hmm. and um, uh and I remember hearing a Marxist Christian theologian 
give an analysis of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations. And he said the most obvious thing. He said, Adam Smith did not write a book called The Wealth of Corporations. He was interested in the wealth of nations and his whole understanding of capitalism had this idea that there was a commons of people who were brought together by national identity and their loyalties to one another played a, a super big role uh, in, in in whatever would be done economically. So yeah, what we have now is so different from that, but the changes have happened gradually, uh, but have been very, very far reaching. And that's part of what's, that's at the very heart of our ecological uh, crisis and uh, our political crisis. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's not surprising to anybody that people run for office not caring whether they win or lose, it just builds their brand, which is going to bring them a whole lot of money over time. Totally, totally. You know, Brian, we've been talking about some obviously wonderful ideas, but these are ideas that affect us personally. And I was wondering yeah. if I could ask you uh, how some of these things affect you more uh, personally. Is that, would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah super um, important, yeah. You know, Brian, when you think of your own trajectory, your own, uh, as you've changed, evolved, and certainly since that book in 1998, um, would you say what has developed your faith, your religion, your existential connection to God, has it been more growing or more awakening? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think, David, I, I, I'd love to hear you talk more about what the differences between those two would be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right, because uh, it could be semantics or a great difference. Certainly from our, our kind of old evangelical days, our 20th century American Western Christianity, it was spiritual growth, spiritual mm -hmm. maturity. Mm -hmm. But when I went through my shift 208, 209, 2010, when I was reading your books in secret in my office of my evangelical church, and then going through a personal existential crisis of my own belief, I was in my early 50s at the time. I would probably answer I've ch and then and then jumping into some therapy I mm -hmm. I yeah I uh and I I teach a a message at our church that say I that spiritual awakening is better than spiritual growth mm -hmm. any day because mm -hmm. spiritual growth was about a destination mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. growing up becoming something yeah where here I here I had grown up. I I you know back to Roar. I was the good soldier, the good lieutenant. Yeah. I I did I did American Christianity really well. I was good at it, uh, and had some talent at it even. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, in one way, I grew. I really really grew. And yes. it doesn't mean I was never self reflective or yes. pure. Um. But it wasn't till my eyes started to open. It wasn't till I started to see and see differently and even see within maybe that third eye uh, that I that I go, okay, I think now I'm transforming. Yeah, 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 I'm with you. Well, first, I think that's a beautiful way to say it. Uh, you know, th there's a, a scene, if people haven't seen this movie, I almost recommend people see the movie just so when they get to this scene, it will have its full impact. Um, but it's the scene at the end of the Truman show where Jim Carrey is sailing his boat and the uh, bow of his boat penetrates a yeah. dome that he finds out he's been living under for his whole life. And I think he does such a great job of acting in that moment to show the terror and just coming undone, that everything he thought the world was, there's now a world on the outside of that. 
And maybe you, you could say that growth represents how we grow up within the dome. And then awakening represents waking up to the fact that there's a bigger world outside of our dome, that that's not all, all of reality. And then no doubt we escape from that because at the end he opens the door and leaves the dome. Um, and then, then what we find out is there are non-physical domes that we create too. And, and so if we were to think of life as a, a process of continual hunger and thirst for truth and love and grace and goodness and justice, and that that was going to help us grow within certain contexts and then maybe break out of those contexts and grow into another one or break out of that one. To me, that's a beautiful and dynamic um, view of life. And unfortunately, what religion has tended to be is a relatively small dome for many people who, for whom, uh, in which you're encouraged to grow, but part of your growing is making a pact that you'll never think of anything beyond the dome. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and to me, this is where, like every once in a while, and right at this moment, I'm getting it right now, I get this little whiff in the air, this little, like, what would happen if people could see that what religion or spirituality is about is that sense of humility and exhilaration to think, what's out there is so far bigger than anything that we'll ever be able to capture in a little dome. And to invite people to the spiritual path is to invite them into kind of a lifetime of openness to awakening and making themselves vulnerable to that kind of awakening. Yeah, that that's to me a beautiful understanding of what religion is supposed to be that is almost the opposite, you know, of this very small uh, Yes. Yeah. And by the way, I, I love that film. And yes, he sails off into the sunset and then bumps right into the, <laughs> and then walk, moment. Wa you know, walks out this same color painted door. It's <laughs> such a beautiful, another film that's been, uh, that's kind of uh, been uh, illustrated for me is the film Pleasantville. Remember yes. it's 1950, yes. black and white world. And then some start to see color and some start to see black, still remain black and white. And you just can't stop. How, how do you stop seeing color? How do you, yeah. how do you, so awakening has been a great metaphor uh, for me. You know, Brian, you, uh, and I know for those who are participating in this and will be watching this, uh, you really were, for a lot of us, our private friend, our private mentor. Um, seriously, I remember having reading your books and and especially reading a new kind of Christian, your narrative novelette story, and just finding my story uh, in yours, and even going, maybe I'm not crazy i was still just as frightened where it would all lead mm. uh but maybe i'm not mm. everything from maybe i'm not bad mm. to maybe i'm not uh, uh crazy but you were really a forerunner you i'm sure i'm sure there was a lot of criticism and still is um uh, and I'm sure you lost some friends. Uh, maybe you didn't lose some, but maybe you lost some along the way, which, as you know, ministry, especially pastoral ministry, envelops our families. When I lost yes, friends, yes, it yes, meant yes. my my spouse and partner lost friends and my children. And uh, I remember a family we were close to broke up with us, you know. Yes, literally. yes, 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 yes. So how have you... And, and the people that are listening, uh, we we hear these stories all the time, right? They've yeah. they've experienced that. How, Brian, how have you dealt with that? Mm. Uh, whether it was rejection, loss, criticism, how? Mm. What's that been like for you? Well, first, David, I think it's really good that you bring this sort of personal dimension of it up because it's not simply an idea of changing ideas. Uh, it, it's it's uh, it's a huge social risk. 
uh, I I mentioned uh, you know having been invited to speak to Mormons who are reading my book, and a couple of years ago I was invited to be on the Zoom call. And all the people in the Zoom call like had to make a commitment that nobody's identity be, will be revealed to anyone outside the call and that it won't be mentioned to anybody. It was like, you know, secrecy. Um, and uh, and, I, and I'll never forget a few minutes into the call, you know, and there was, I don't know, 70 or 80 people on the call. And one of the people in one of the little boxes, this lady says, with just the sweetest, spirit you know she says brian i just want you to understand what every one of us in these little boxes is dealing with she said if this the i forget the title the stake leader the stake president the guy who runs our congregation um if if he were to know i was on this call i would be called in tomorrow and i would be asked questions and i would be disfellowshipped she said the next day my children would be expelled from their school uh, she said by the end of the week no one who does business with my husband's business would do business with him anymore. Uh, by the end of the weekend, uh, our families would all make a decision that we weren't invited to family events anymore. And she said, within a few weeks, we would be in so much financial trouble, we would have to move to a new state and start a new life totally from scratch once again. Well, when she said those words, it, it brought back to a memory. I was invited by I received a very unusual invitation some years ago. Um, someone contacted me and said, would you be willing to accept a speaking engagement if I didn't tell you who it was to um, and couldn't really tell you anything about it except give you a location to go to? And you can't let anybody know you're going to this location. So it sounded interesting. And he said, so-and-so gave me your name and I trusted that person. So I showed up and these were leaders of an evangelical denomination, not the top leaders, but a whole range of mid-level leaders in this denomination. And they said the same thing. If it were found out that we were having this meeting with you, we would all be fired and da 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 da. And one fellow said to me, um, uh, I wasn't even brought up in this denomination. I married into it. But he said, if uh, it was found out that I would be here, I'm not sure if my wife would stay with me because her loyalty to the denomination has been ingrained in her so deeply that that's more important than me if I were to fall out of favor. So all that's to say, the emotional cost of this, none of us can take that lightly. It is it is a great cost. I went through it. I'm, I'm happy that I was in my late 30s when I started to go through it. I was old enough that I wouldn't be psychologically damaged by the kind of things that I experienced. Um, I was in personal conversations, phone conversations, and uh, email conversations where I have never been treated as badly by anybody. Uh, no enemy treated me as badly as people I respected. And uh, so I saw very, very ugly things. The irony was people thought by treating me really badly, that would make me afraid so that I would stay in the fold. But what it did is it made me think, why would I want to submit myself to a system that treats people like this? So it had this weird effect of, uh, and, and the result of it was that I, I had to go deeper in my own spiritual life. And many people would know, I, I don't feel bad mentioning his name now, um, but many people would know the name Dallas Willard, and Dallas was a good friend. And I never liked to mention this when he was alive because I didn't want to hurt his reputation with people who trusted him and couldn't st stand me. But um, Dallas once uh, gave me this little printout. He said, I think you're going to need this. And uh, it was a prayer by a Serbian Orthodox bishop. And if anybody's interested, if they go to my website, which is brianmcclaren.net, and just put in the little uh, search box, prayer for enemies. Um, Dallas gave me that prayer, and I prayed it so much so that I almost have, it's very long, almost have it memorized. Um, I prayed it again and again. And that prayer by the Serbian Orthodox Bishop took me to a deeper place in my spiritual life, where in some ways I what we I refer to Howard Thurman, the sound of the genuine. I I decided it was okay to go with the sound of the genuine, <laughs> and and even if it meant uh, and and to not do that with bitterness toward the people 
who were treating me in that way. And partly that became easier because I understood they had to treat me that way or somebody else would treat them that way, you know, so. It's good, Brian. So good. Um, yeah, you know, Brian, I'm, sh I'm sure you're, uh, of course, uh, I'm sure you're well aware of attachment theory in, yeah. in human relationships and, and um and it's it's one thing i i hold on to but it's something I'm, I'm still trying to figure out in my spirituality as as even my own understanding of, of what what we would call in theology classical theism as a, a perspective of god is changing um i sort of want to end with how we began that as this whole thing shifts brian i still hold on to that that love is the central energy of uh my christianity uh i i i still think you know it, back to richard war if everything belongs i'm also a believer that if you want to listen to the real theologians today listen to quantum physicist and molecular <laughs> biologist now you'll see the real theologians of today that everything is related everything that whether we call love belonging whether we call love the naked now whether we call love that everything relates to each other if something on a quantum level happens in in yakima washington it's still felt in trenton new jersey um so how do you somebody that's experienced a major theological shift and yet i think has said i have stayed christian doesn't mean you're not pluralistic towards others uh how do you how do you relate to god is god is 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 Christ still personal? Um, has it shift? Is it is it one day one thing? How mm -hmm. how does that? Are you attached to this yeah. personal God who yeah. walks with me and talks with me? So, David, this is such an important question, and you're framing it so well. And I want to try to honor the question, uh, but. I should tell you, this is something that I someday hope I'll be ready to write about, and I don't feel ready to write about it. So let me try to say a few things about it, knowing that it's, you know, it's very hard to put into words. Um, so I think what we have inherited is two main categories. One category is of a personal God who is a monarch and a patriarch. And the other is an impersonal universe where we can't quite figure out if there is, if there ultimately is any such thing as a person, because in that, in that uh, universe, life and consciousness seem to be able to be reduced to physics and chemistry. Um, and when we're given those, if I'm given those two choices, uh, I mean, I, I fi would find it very, very hard to choose between those two. And if people, it, it, I watch some people who are so disgusted with the patriarchal, personal, monarch, controlling, dominating God, that they just say, that's causing so much trouble, I I'm done with it. And they're so relieved. They might be relieved for 20 or 30 years and then they die. And so they, the rest of their life, they're okay having to let it go because the relief is so great. But I'm someone who had doubts about God from my youngest years. And I think I take seriously that idea of an inanimate universe in which there's no room for, in which what we call consciousness and love and personhood is an anomaly that really can't be explained and ultimately gets reduced to physics, chemistry, electricity. I think there is a third option between those two. And that third option honors and takes seriously the presence of life, the reality of life. 
and the reality of personhood. And it, it, what it does is it takes this sort of two-tiered supernatural universe on the one side and this one-tiered reduced naturalistic universe on the other side and says, neither of those work. I think there's one universe and it contains love and personhood and uh, attachment and all of that, that it's there. And so I, I maybe I'll say one other thing and then feel free to either, we could end it there if you wanna ask something else, but I, because I wanna be honest about this and I don't know if I put this into words so well, but where I find myself now, this is why I still call myself a Christian. One of the reasons I still call myself a Christian is because I see something of that fusion in Jesus and it makes me love Jesus. I love Jesus. I'm attracted to Jesus. I'm, I don't have a problem saying that. And, and, and by the way, I, I love the Buddha. I, I don't know as much about the Buddha, but uh, I, I love the Buddha. And you know, I, I don't agree with 100% of everything Muhammad said, but when I understand Muhammad in his context, you know, I love him. But my soul, my sort of first love is Jesus. And that's, uh, I think, I, I'm with, I'm good with that. I have no reason ever to step away from that. In fact, the irony is the deeper I go in that, the more I love Jesus. And um, And when I speak of God for me, I start with the revelation of personhood and kindness and mercy that I see in Jesus. So uh, that's her. But the interesting thing is, it doesn't stop there. So uh, for the last few months, I had this uh, red-shouldered hawk who was, he was just a, you know, young hawk, a freshly fledged hawk. And he didn't know enough to be afraid of me. So he would sit in my backyard and I'd walk out and he was sort of uncoordinated and gangly, but he liked to sit in my yard because he can catch lizards and he pounces down off the fence and catches lizards. And I'd see him eating, you know, different things he catches in my yard. And so every time I'd see him, I would just be quiet, not bother him, sort of keep my distance, but I would actually talk to him, you know, just to try to make sure he was listening to me. I don't, obviously, I don't think he understands English, but I think he has ears. And so I had his attention. And what I did is through my actions, I tried to communicate to him, uh, I'm another living being and I'm not going to eat you and, uh, and we can be around each other. And, uh, and when I, and now months and months later, he's much bigger and he's not afraid of me. And I can, I don't get too close to me to fly away, but we have this distance of respect. And when I'm in his presence, uh, I feel I'm loving God. I'm loving God expressed. In the book of Genesis, it says the breath of life goes into every living creature. And it's not like I really love God when I'm in church and then I sort of love God. No, I really love God when I'm in church and I really love God when I'm with this red-shouldered hawk and 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 the trees and the plants and the stars and air itself, which is just amazing. And so my attachment, uh, that personal attachment feels, I don't know, that's the best I can do to explain it. Oh, so good. <laughs> I so hope that's good. helpful. Um, you know, Brian, uh, uh, a couple, uh, my wife and I are, are one of our best couple friends are co-rabbis at a local synagogue. Mm -hmm. And um, they are truly some of our best and safest friends. And I'm so glad that my 1980s and 1990 days aren't here anymore that I have to convert <laughs> uh, my Jewish rabbi friends. I'll, I'll tell you one anecdote about this. My first copy of Do I Stay Christian? <laughs> They were in my little office just off our sanctuary, and they were speaking at our church, and I stepped out and came back in, and Lori, one of the rabbis, had was had pulled down your book, and in the hour before the service, she would had read a significant part of it, and she goes, I'm loving this book, and I said, well, take it, just take it. I'll, I'll get another copy. And um, so I just wanted to let you know that she oh, was loving neat. your book. But my, my, my friend, Rabbi Flip, he's, his name's Philip, and he goes by Flip. And <laughs> it's the similar thing when 
when we're having breakfast and he's explaining Judaism to, he's a reformed Jew. When he's explaining reformed Judaism to me or his Jewish life, I walk away going, it helps me to love and attach to Jesus more. Yes, yes. And yes, then yes. when he asks me questions about the New Testament and Jesus, and he knows about my whole shift. Um, you know, when I explain New Testament Christianity, of course, from my perspective, he'll tell me it takes him deeper into his Judaism. I'm not trying to make him a Christian. He's not yes. trying to make me a Jew. We're just two souls that are attaching to God uh, through whatever, through this mystery that is our constructs, is our time and place in history, is in what is comfortable to us. And I kind of sound savvy, but it's just a beautiful, oh, oh, oh. beautiful thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, everything I know about Jesus says that Jesus would be going, that's the whole point, that's the whole point. And I have a feeling that, you know, a whole lot of other uh, people that, uh, yeah. would 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 yeah. be saying the same thing so and and here and that's when you describe that uh, it makes me feel that's why this work is worth doing and that's why networks like this network that you're helping and 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 part of are so important because as other people reject us and say if you want to go in that direction uh then you are out as far as we concern um then well, we got to find some other people who know how sweet and good and important this is and want to go there with us. Not to hate all those other people, but to love them and say, I understand why they feel that way. I used to feel that way too. And, you know, yeah, Father, forgive them. They they don't know what they do. And right. and then and then to say, but look, I need some friends and let me find those friends wherever I can. Yeah. Well, Brian, you um you've helped so many of us and still do. And even before you wrote a book, uh, Do I Stay Christian? Um, seriously, Brian, your writings, you helped me to stay uh, oh, Christian. Wow. I had to go on all three parts. I had to go on the journey of all three yeah. parts of that book. Yeah. Uh, yes, maybe. No, I, I was a minister of a church and going, no, I think I'm out. No, I think yeah. I'm out yeah. Yeah. and then return back to, well, I'm in, but if I'm in, how is it going to be different? So I just want to say for me, and I know for, for many others, you have, whatever, whatever name we give God, you, you have helped so many of us stay attached um, and attached by love to this mysterious love connection uh, to something far larger than ourselves. So thank oh. you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that. As you can imagine, that means a lot to me. And I know you're doing that for other people and we're all, all in this together. So that's a, a beautiful thing. Thanks. Thanks. And Brian, are you working, uh, are you working on something new or now that you can or can't divulge or? No, no, I always can divul divulge, but, um, yeah. So, uh, I had a book that was supposed to come out in early 2025 called Life After Doom, dealing with our ecological and political and economic and racial mm -hmm. crises. And um, and uh, I sent my manuscript in in June and my editor said, gosh, I don't think we can wait till 2025. So it's going to come out in May of next year. So actually, as soon as we're off this call, I'll be back. I'm editing from morning to night to get to get this thing in the shape it needs to be in. So that'll be then. And then I have a children's book uh, that I co-authored with Gareth Higgins called Corey and the Seventh Story that comes out in October. It's really, I'm super happy about that. Oh, too. exciting. And uh, Brian, why were you thinking it would be 2025, just as you wanted to prepare and study. And then why did the editor go? Is it the obviously reading the tea leaves of the time that the editor is going, no, we got to get this book out now? You know, I was really tired. Uh, I, the last I've written a lot in the last few years, and I just thought I needed my brain to work really, really slowly. 
but this book just poured out the more I worked on it. And so I sent it to her. It was like 80,000 words. And I said, look, could you um, tell me which 20,000 words to cut? And I thought I had six more months to do that. And she wrote back and well, I'd sent it to her in beginning of July when first we had all those record temperatures and then she lives in New York and the smoke from the Canadian fires was coming down. And then there was major flooding here and there and major fires here and there. And she just said, gosh, it feels like the doom you're writing about is happening. I think uh, people need this sooner. Is there any way you could do it sooner? So uh, wow. that's how that unfolded. Yeah. Oh, wow. So. Wow. Um, well, Brian, thank you. Thank you. I can't, um, it's, it's a joy and a pleasure privilege to talk with you and to hear your thoughts so hard. well i look forward to connecting in person and i hope someday in person with uh, the folks who you're uh, who are in this network so thanks so much for the invitation it's been a total joy oh you bet